Professor Melanie Hildebrandt here. I'm trying to redo a video. I had a baby wake up in the middle of my last recording, so that's why you can already see some of the answers written out. But I'm going to work some problems from Chapter 7. This was our chapter on global markets. And in this first recording, I'm going to work three basic problems, numbers 12, 13, and 14. This is on page 173 of edition 12. I'll have a second recording that I post where I work a more complicated problem. Question 12. Suppose that the world price of sugar is 10 cents a pound. Okay, so our world price is 10 cents, but that the U.S. does not trade internationally, and the equilibrium price of sugar in the United States is 20 cents. So we have a higher price in the U.S. What then happens when the U.S. begins to trade internationally? Question A, how does the price of sugar in the U.S. change? Well, the price is going to fall, okay? Sugar is sugar is sugar. Most consumers don't care between different brands. If the world sugar is cheaper, you're going to buy the sugar from another country instead of from the U.S. suppliers. So we'll see the price of sugar decrease down to the world price of 10 cents once we have free trade. Part B. Do U.S. consumers buy more or less? We're going to follow the law of demand. Because price decreased, we're going to see quantity demanded increase. Part C, do U.S. sugar growers produce more or less sugar? Now we're looking to the law of supply. Price went down. So does quantity supplied by our U.S. growers. And finally, question D, does the U.S. export or import sugar? We're going to have to import the difference. Okay, because now quantity demanded is greater than the quantity supplied in the domestic market, we will import sugar to make up the difference by which demand, uh, quantity demanded exceeds our quantity supplied in the market. Okay, now we're going to move on to question 13. Like I said, these are pretty basic. This is a similar question. Now we're looking at the market for steel, uh, and we're looking at India. So we're told that the world price of steel is $100 per ton, that India does not initial, initially trade internationally, and that the equilibrium price of steel in India is $60 per ton. So now we have a case where the domestic market's price is cheaper than the global market. So part A. How does the price of steel change in India when India begins to trade internationally? Well, the price of steel in India is going to rise to equal that world price. So the price in India will increase. Well, how's that going to affect uh, the quantity of steel produced? So we're going to look at quantity supplied first, again going by the law of supply, price goes up, and so producers will respond to this higher price by increasing the quantity that they produce. In terms of quantity demanded in the domestic market in India, they're going to respond to this higher price following the law of demand by decreasing the quantity of steel that they bought. So part D then says, okay, well, is India going to export or import steel? And again, because the price of steel in India was lower than the rest of the world, they have that comparative advantage, and we're going to see them export. Again, now in our domestic market in India, quantity supplied is going to be greater than quantity demanded, and so the steel producers in India will export the difference. Okay. Briefly here, one more question. Uh, from this chapter. This is going to be question number 14. Okay, and here we're looking at the market for semiconductors. Uh, it's a key component in laptops, cell phones, tablets, etc. And the book provides us, let me show you guys here, with the, this is the uh, market for semiconductors in the United States. So first column is the price, second column is the quantity demanded in the U.S. market, and the last column is the quantity supplied. And we're told that producers of semiconductors can get $18 per unit on the world market. So the price in the world 
is currently $18 a unit. So question A, with no international trade, what would be the price of a semiconductor and what would be the quantity bought and sold in the United States? So again, let's refer back to the market schedule here for the United States. Where's our equilibrium? That's all this question is asking us to find. Our equilibrium, recall, is simply the price where quantity demanded equals quantity supplied. So hopefully you can see that at a price of 12, quantity demanded is 20 billion units, quantity supplied is a matching 20 billion units per year. So for our answer here, our equilibrium price in the US is, I messed that up, I wrote quantity, is $12 per unit, okay? And our equilibrium quantity in the US is 20 billion semiconductors um, per year. Question B, does the United States have a comparative advantage in producing semiconductors? And the answer is yes. Yes, the United States does have a comparative advantage in producing semiconductors. How do we know this? We know this because the U.S. price is lower than the price in the world market. 